Okay, good morning everybody. I'm standing here to teach you how to make a salad and tomato salsa. I'm just kidding. So I'm standing here to talk about how to charge your cell phone using a defective tomatoes. If it was a fresh tomato, you wouldn't bother, right? You'll have those tomatoes in the kitchen. So once it's defective, once it's rotten, nobody wants to use it. So what can you do with this particular thing? So I call it as little galvanic tomato station. This is where you can charge all your low-powered electronic devices. And that was the animation for squished tomatoes. <laughs> so how do you build this station? We have four major components. It's quite easy to build. You need an anode which is going to have carbonaceous material, the membrane, the cathode, and you bring a smart grad student or an engineer, you can assemble everything into a simple cell. We call it as a galvanic cell. You could also call it as fuel cell. And then here I'm going to teach you a little math, which will help you generate electricity out of these defective tomatoes. You add a little bit of waste, and in this case, it's tomato waste, and I'll need the help of little friend here, bacteria. It has helped me build my career. And once you have bacteria sitting with the, with the waste, and once the bacteria starts using the waste, in this case, defective tomatoes, as the food, it's going to jump with joy to generate electricity. And you have these electrons flowing out of the circuit once it's configured in a right manner. And then you can light a little bulb. And you could also stack these cells in series and parallel configuration to amplify the voltage and current and use it for any other better purpose. If you come to my lab, we have something called a scanning electron microscopy. You take a little piece of the anode, which is carbonaceous material, a conducting material. You zoom that material a million times, and this is what you're going to see through the microscope lens. And this is where the magic would happen. Here, I'm going to introduce the bacteria. Okay? And once the bacteria feels like it is its home, and it is going to eat the food that we are going to provide. It doesn't have any choice. Hopefully, it likes tomatoes. But here, we are going to exploit the microbial metabolism. We are going to deprive the cell out of oxygen. Oxygen is a typical electron acceptor used by human beings or any living cells for its respiration. So all of a sudden, I'm going to say that I'm not going to give you oxygen. If you want to live, you'll have to use that solid anode as the electron acceptor. And poor bacteria has no choice. It's going to live with that as the terminal electron acceptor and complete its respiration. So to survive, it needs its food. It's going to be defective tomatoes. To breathe, it has to breathe against solid wall, which is going to be conducting in nature. And in that process, we are going to get the electrons out, generate electric current, and that's going to pass through the electric circuit, and that is how we get electric battery. So to back up a little bit, why do we need to sacrifice these tomatoes? Again, here we are not talking about fresh tomatoes. My wife would like to prepare a good dish at the kitchen, but I'm talking about defective tomatoes. So do we have enough amount of defective tomatoes in the country? In fact, I come from India, which, is a, which, is, which bears a tropical climate, and we produce a lot of tomatoes, and we also produce defective tomatoes. Same thing happens with any tropical country and many of the countries around the world. We produce a lot of fresh tomatoes every day throughout the year, and in that process, we also generate something called as defective tomatoes. To give you an example, if you like the tomato ketchup or yummy tomato products, they, should all, they all go through tomato processing plants, and they have their own quality control. And one out of 100 tomatoes, they are discarded because they would not meet the requirements. And we call them as defective tomatoes. We generate approximately 1.35 billion pounds of defective tomatoes every year in the, in the United States. There are a lot of tomatoes. And if you think from fundamental point of view, again, I'm going to, I like touching tomatoes, kinesthetic experience. You have three major components here. One, the skin on the tomatoes, and then you cut it open, you have 
that nice softy flesh and then inside you have teeny tiny seeds, the tomato seeds. All of these three components are rich in terms of nutrition and I'm going to tell you why. Sucrose. Tomato is loaded with sucrose, several grams of sucrose per one fresh tomato or even defective tomatoes. We like sucrose, it's similar to table sugar. Bacteria would also like to eat sugar, right? It's the same thing. Tomato is loaded with proteins, a series of amino acids. We build muscle using, tomato, uh, using the proteins, but bacteria would requ require the proteins to build its own organs and organelles. It has the nutrients. To give you an example, you could talk about calcium, iron, sulfur, and all these kind of minerals that we usually buy in form of multivitamin supplements in Walgreens or Walmart. And it also has special redox active substances. That is what makes the tomato so special. These redox active species, they actually are capable of pulling the electrons. They act like little shuttles. They, they hold the elect electrons, they walk, supply those electrons to the electrode, they come back, and they continue that electricity generation process. That is what makes the defective tomatoes quite special. And it has a range of vitamins like riboflavin and so on. And I have my nutrition store, and I'm sure bacteria would love to chew on this nutrition store. A slight deviation in the technical concept. Let's talk about what would happen if I don't use my galvanic station to produce electricity out of defective tomatoes. What is happening to these defective tomatoes in the current modern world? If you discharge these defective tomatoes into flowing water, let's say a rapid creek, you have tons of bacterial populations sitting there waiting for an opportunity to eat its food. It's okay, we can feed the bacteria in the water, but in that process, it's going to deplete the dissolved oxygen. And in a matter of time, in a matter of few days, your rapid creek would turn septic. And we don't want that hydrogen sulfur smell. It's going to create water pollution. You therefore have to treat it, and you are obliged to treat because we have certain regulatory stipulations coming from Environmental Protection Agency. And the current practices with respect to the waste management policies, you could either take all this tomato waste, put it in the landfill, you know, easy way to hide the waste. But if you leave the tomato waste in the landfill, you have bacteria everywhere, and the bacteria is going to chew on the landfill. It's going to be an uncontrolled biodegradation process. In that process, it's going to generate methane. Methane is a greenhouse gas. It is good if we can capture that methane to produce something useful. If not, it's going to be emitted into the atmosphere. Uh, we have explosion problems, and we have greenhouse gases and a series of other problems. We could also take this organic waste and pump it into the wastewater treatment plant. If you think about it, you have the kitchen, you have the sink, we have the food grinders, and all of a sudden, you generate all this organic waste and it flows down the sink and it's magic, right? It disappears. It's not magic, it goes through the sewers, it gets into the wastewater treatment plants, and that is where you, get, you spend taxpayers' money, so money out of your pocket, and you spend nearly 110 kilowatts of electricity to treat one million gallon of wastewater on a daily basis. So to give you some statistics, you're spending billions of dollars every year to treat the waste. So instead of treating waste management as a problem, why don't we use the waste to generate electricity? So it's almost going from one end of the spectrum to another end of the spectrum, taking the negatives, converting that into positive. Here comes the interesting slide. <laughs> Series of results. And if you think that I'm going to talk about each slide, you're wrong. Uh, it took several years for us to generate these results. In fact, I have Namita Shreshta. She's one of the grad students. and several other students, including Alex Fogg, Joseph Wilder, and other team members. We sat down in the lab countless hours trying to s establish the feasibility of using this process to generate electricity. And I can talk about technical results some other day, but to keep it smooth, I have converted all my results into single graph. On the x-axis, you have current density. On the y-axis, you have power density easy enough to read. And if you look at the maximal range, you can generate approximately 4 amps of current and approximately 0.5 watts of uh, current 
per every meter squared of the electrode. If I talk to any electrical engineer, he's going to laugh at me. He's going to tell me that, oh, it's a minuscule amount of electricity. What would you do with this electricity? And my answer is, you could take each cell again, put everything in series and parallel configuration. Basically, you can take 100 cells or even 1,000 cells if this concept can be scaled to that aspect. And then you can amplify your wattage or your amperage. And we have our results reviewed by our tough peers in some of the leading journals. And we have all the uh, technical details sitting there. When we disclosed the fact that we can generate electricity out of this defective tomatoes, it went into the media outlet. And one of the keen readers, very keen, he said, how many tomatoes would you need to generate, let's say, 100 watts of electricity? And then I said, let me run down to my lab. We ran some mathematical calculation. And then we came up with simple explanation here. Bring me a can of soda. It could be Coke, Pepsi, but I just want an empty can. You add a little water. 350 milliliters or 12 ounces. You add 3.5 milligrams of tomato waste. I'm saying it's 3.5 milligrams, so very tiny amount of waste. You convert that can into the galvanic cell, galvanic station. You keep the bacteria happy in that particular can. You should be able to generate approximately 250 milliwatts of electricity, and that should sustain for nearly one week. So that was the answer I said. But the reader was not happy. I mean, he wants me to connect that to something big, something practical. Then we ran the calculations again. We said, well, on theoretical basis, if you bring me all the defective tomatoes that are being generated by the state of Florida throughout an year, you put them in one place, and you use it as food for my bacteria in the galvanic station, the amount of energy you have in this tomato waste should be good enough to light the Disney world for 10 days continuously. There are several missions by NASA. One mission would be the lunar mission. And uh, if the crew members travel in the space for, let's say, 10 or 15 years, usually it takes very long time to reach the moon and stay at the moon and do whatever they want to. In that process, they are going to take the food from planet Earth, and they're going to generate a lot of waste. So to the NASA, we proposed, can we try using this microbial process of the galvanic station to condense the waste, so minimize the waste volume, and at the same time, generate electricity out of that particular waste and use that waste to power, again, low electronic power devices in the remote places. Let's talk about my vision for the future to make a product out of any biotechnology process. You'll have to remember a few things. You'll need a reliable source of bacteria. You need a reliable source of raw materials. And I think this particular process is going to really help in both the cases. One, because we are generating tomato waste throughout the year, so you have continuous supply of the raw material there. It's always going to be of the homogeneous composition, no matter where you buy this tomato and which season of the year you buy these tomatoes, you're going to have the same nutrition packed in the tomatoes. So in terms of the bacterial process, you have constant supply of vitamins, nutrition and other things coming into or flowing into the bacterial metabolism. It would be more attractive option for remote parts of geographical region. And we are definitely working on the scalability aspects in collaboration with material scientists. We have chemists working with us. We have microbiology people working with us. And with all that said, I'm sure you have several questions. And one of the questions you might have is, can we power an entire city with tomatoes? or with defective tomatoes? And the answer is yes. Thank you. <laughs>